oh, wh for whatever reason, I'm too old, I missed the boat. And I think Robert's story is that example of anything's possible, you know? Um, and so I'm excited to have him because um, I, his story, whether you wanna be a writer or not, I think will, will inspire all of us. I know I'm inspired and I've never aspired to be an author. So the format's gonna be that I'm gonna ask a few questions of, of Robert that uh, we pre-prepared. And then I know some people have submitted questions to Lisa. So she's gonna ask those questions and we'll prompt you guys when you could add your questions to the chat. We did leave it where everybody's muted. Um, and so the questions, when you have them, please put them in the chat and we'll let you know. Just so that you know, Robert, there's a lot of positive comments going in the chat. People love you. They're saying congratulations. Great to see you. So check that out when, uh, you know, when you have a moment. Uh, there's a lot of love out there. So, so welcome back to Brooklyn College. Thank you. So I'm going to start off by asking you, tell us a little bit about your journey, because I know it's an interesting one. Yes, 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 indeed. Um, so I... Um, I'm a late bloomer. I, I like to call myself a late bloomer. Um, prior to re-enrolling into Brooklyn College at the age of 31, I sort of had somewhat of a tumultuous upbringing. Um, I was um, raised primarily in a section of Brooklyn known as like Bensonhurst Gravesend. And at the time that I was growing up, um, it was, there was a lot of um, racial animus. And I went to elementary school, uh, middle school and high school in that area and um, suffered a lot of trauma around um, race, but also a lot of trauma around my budding queerness um, as I was coming into that identity. And that left me with um, a very bad taste in my mouth around other students around um, faculty who did not protect me. And um, I wound up dropping out of high school because I was bullied so relentlessly that I just could not go there and feel safe. And um, I got my GED um, shortly after and um, attempted in 1992, my first semester in Brooklyn College, um, not knowing what I wanted to do. I had no idea. I was just going to college because I, know, I knew that was what you were supposed to do. Um, and this was back in the days when there, was no, there were no computers. Um, you had to enroll, like, like you had to stand on like lines that went on for hours and hours to enroll in each particular course. course. So that was just like outrageous. Um, I did pretty well in my first semester. I, I got an A plus in English, but I still didn't realize that that was my, my um, calling. I wanted to be at that point a psychologist. Um, I got a C in psychology. <laughs> um, and then in my second semester, because of things that were going on at home, I did really, really badly and felt a great deal of shame about doing really badly and dropped out. And I started working. I worked at Toys R Us. And um, part of the reason why I had to work was because um, I came from, a, uh, I come from a very poor family and I had to help um, with the rent and the bills and all these, all, all sorts of things like that. So um, work became a priority and it was not something that I enjoyed. It was something that I was doing because I had to do it um, to survive so that my family could survive. But there was still this nagging voice in me that kept saying, you're not living up to your potential. You have a purpose. All of your teachers used to tell you when you were a kid, you were so smart and you know, all of these things and you're not living up to that. You're not doing the things that you should be doing. So I tried again in 1997, I re-enrolled into Brooklyn College. And again, because of so many personal things happening in my life, I bombed out. I wound up leaving New York City um, after working for Toys R Us for about 10 years. I kind of got promoted in the ranks and I, I left Toys R Us as an HR um, person. I was, in, I was in charge of their HR for a particular location. I 
parlayed that into a job with Bank of America in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, working in their HR department. Um, significant salary increase, change of scenery. I thought that would be good for me. It would, it be, it would mark um, for me a sign of maturity, of me stepping away from what was familiar and taking a risk with something that was new and different and would give me a chance to sort of um, start my life over. But I kept missing one vital lesson, which was I was not listening to what it was that I was supposed to be doing because I had been writing since I was six years old. Um, my father bought me my first comic book when I was four. And it was a Wonder Woman comic book. And by the time I learned how to write, I was rewriting Wonder Woman stories with me in them as her sidekick and realized that I had such, um, that writing for me was not just um, cathartic, um, but it was an escape. It was the world that I could create that felt like the world I should be living in. And so writing had become a, a, form, a, a, a tremendous form of expression for me. And I, um, I had continually written since I was six years old. But I came from a you know, traditional blue collar family who said, you know, you have to have a nine to five with good um, health benefits and a great pension. Writing is some little hobby, but you can never think of that as a profession. So even though I had these feelings of, of wanting to be a writer, I always discounted them and said, okay, I have to get a good job to, in order to be able to take care of myself. And that's the lesson that I kept missing. So I'm at Bank of America um, and I'm realizing I feel unfulfilled and the job is becoming incredibly tedious and boring to me. And I start self-sabotaging because I realize I'm not happy. I'm just almost in a state of complete despair. Um, and I wind up getting fired from Bank of America. And my, my gut instinct was, okay, I have to update my resume and look for another job in this industry. But wouldn't you know it, um, I'm watching an episode of the Oprah Winfrey show and she has this guest on, um, this is like maybe four or five days after I was um, let go from, from Bank of America. And this guest is saying, you know what your purpose is and you've been avoiding it your entire life. Don't think about the last step you have to take in order to make that a reality. Think about just the next step you have to take in order to make your dream a reality. And don't think about money. The money will follow. Just think about fulfilling yourself as a, as a human being um, as whatever it is that you see yourself doing, um, whatever your wildest dream is for yourself. So I'm at the unemployment office and I'm waiting online and there's this big sign, big white sign. And at the top it says, if you wanna be A, then you have to, and it's two columns. So I'm looking at the list on the left and I've, I'm looking for writer because I, at this point I'm like, this is the thing that I really wanna do. So I get down near the bottom and it says, if you wanna be a writer, then you have to go to college. <laughs> so at the age of 31, um, I called my mom. I said, Ma, I, I wanna move back home. She says, your room is still here. Gathered up all my stuff, moved back from Charlotte, North Carolina, re-enrolled at Brooklyn College. And so because I had done relatively poorly in my first attempts at Brooklyn College, I was on academic probation. So I met with a counselor and she said, you have to make sure that you really know what you're doing here and um, that you really commit to your, your learning. And I said, no, I, I completely understand why I'm here now. I did not know why I was here before. And that is why my performance was that way, but I know why I'm here now. So at the end of that semester, I had to go back to the to the guidance counselor. And she looks up, she goes into the system and she looks up my grades and she has this like shocked look on her face. I got three A pluses and an A. And she said, oh my goodness, what a turnaround. And from that point on, um, the lowest grade I got for that portion of my college career was an A minus. So I, I was not playing games. 
Um, I knew why I was there. I was I, I chose creative writing as my major. Um, I made sure I, I reached out to all of my faculty as mentors. I still have so many who still to this day check on me, whether it's um, Professor George Cunningham, Professor Ronnie Natov, um, so many others um, who um, look at me and see me still as um, the student that they all were rooting for. And so that is how my journey to Brooklyn College sort of happened. It was a bumpy road and it was also not the, the path that I imagined because in my head, um, as a, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And so I was supposed to go to college at 18, um, graduate at, at, at 22, you know, get my master's degree, get a high paying job and, and all of those things that I thought I was supposed to be. But I realized that for me, that picture was not my picture. And that, that picture isn't everybody's picture. I had to find um, through trial and error um, what my particular purpose was. And I had to pursue it, even though I felt um, enrolling in Brooklyn College at age 31, I did feel a, a, a great deal of shame because I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna be so much older than all of these other students. They're all young. They all did the right thing in terms of um, going um, right from high school to college. And I took this really long way around. And will they look down on me? Um, should I be ashamed of myself for taking this long? But I realized that even though I felt that shame, this was the thing I should be doing anyway. So someone once said to me, the definition of courage isn't being fearless, it's having fear and doing it anyway. And so that's what I did. I had fear and did it anyway. Wow, I just, I, I know everyone else is muted, but whew, I, I, that like I'm getting goosebumps because I didn't even, I've known Robert for years. I didn't even know all these aspects of your story. And I do want to point out Ronnie Natov is on is here and Professor Perez y Gonzalez and, and many of your colleagues from you know communication. So um, just wanted you to, to be aware of that. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm inspired and, and again in awe of how many times you kind of got, I guess, knocked down or you could have taken a different path but you push yourself so, you know, forward and um, that the little signs along the way that kind of helped you when you maybe weren't um, sure. And, and I'm sure seeing some of the people on here, um, your message is resonating with them and, and probably making them think, you know, what, what am I doing today and, and should I be doing something else? So I, you answered some of the, uh, the questions. So I'm gonna skip a little bit ahead. Um, so you, went to Brooklyn College and then you went to get your MFA. So talk a little bit about that because then after that, you came to work to, for Brooklyn College and kind of help us with that kind of thought process, how that ended up happening. I did. After, after all I had experienced, as I just um, informed everyone about, I was still sort of in panic mode um, at some points, when I was an undergrad, I worked three part-time jobs. So I was going to school full-time and I worked three part-time jobs at the same time. Then um, when I got accepted into Brooklyn's um, MFA program in fiction, which Ellen Tremper told me that I might be the first Brooklyn College undergrad that was ever accepted into that program, which is like, wow. Um, so I got, I got accepted into the MFA program. And this is when I'm sort of thinking about this, this novel, The Prophets, that, that I wound up writing. Um, so I'm wondering, okay, what am I doing? A am I gonna actually take this risk and, and become an, a published author? But in the meantime, what do I do? So I was working at the Scholastic Store. That was one of the part-time jobs I was working, which was somewhat in the industry that I wanted to work in. I was working in a bookstore and you know I wanted to be an author. So um, I wound up, taking a full-time job there in sales, which was the absolute wrong decision to make. And I wound up um, resigning. And um, so I am 
I, I'm just graduating the MFA program. I'm resigning from um, Scholastic and the, the, um, uh, the economy crashes. And this is 2008. And I'm like, this was, the, this was the worst decision I ever made. I, you know, I trusted myself to come back to school and, and, and um, become a writer and it's not working out. Maybe I was wrong. I said, well, you know what? Let me think about what I need to be doing. Then I remembered in my final semester that I, I attended this seminar with this woman named Natalia Guerin Klein, where she talked about the Magna Career Center. And I said, you know what? Let me go and, and talk with Natalia Guerin Klein about where I am and where, where I feel like I should be in terms of a career and what I would like to do in terms of a career. So I went back to Brooklyn College and I made an appointment at the Magna Career Center and I met with Natalia. And I have to tell you that my, that is where my life began to utterly change. The Magna Career Center helped me to understand what it was that I needed to be doing and how I needed to get there. So I was getting um, help with my resume. And let me just be clear, the, the Magna Center doesn't do your resume for you. They help you to understand how you should be doing your resume so that you're best selling your best qualities for a potential employer. Um, what I like to say is you get out of the Magna Center what you put in. And I was absolutely committed to ensuring that I got a job in the industry that I wanted to be in. And I wanted to write. That's what I wanted to do. So Natalia put me in touch with um, some of our alumni, including Dan DiDio, who used to be the um, president and publisher of DC Comics, um, where I, you know, I used to write about Wonder Woman. <laughs> so that was, I got to meet him and he took me around the offices and all of these things and gave me advice on how to break in. And when Natalia and the team at the Magner Center were done with me, I went out on three interviews, just like cold three interviews and got three job offers. And so that was just like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna be a writer. And so that's when I started working for um, Brooklyn College's Office of Communications and Marketing as a, that was my first job as a actual writer where I got to write stories about our wonderful alumni, our, our great donors, and of course, our wonderful students um, and faculty um, and that, was the most re rewarding part of working for the communications office was that I got to tell the stories of these remarkable people um, from Brooklyn College, which you know we used to be called the poor man's Harvard. And I, I tell people to this day that I, will, I would put my Brooklyn College education up against anybody from Yale or Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge. I, I put my education up there with, with those places and I don't have as much debt. I have no debt. Excellent, excellent. And I think, um, you know, I appreciate the shout out to the Magner Center, but we cannot work magic. You, you had it, you had the talent. Uh, we made some connections maybe, but it was all there. But, you know, what you've accomplished is, is you know, everyone I think along the way saw your, your potential and your gift. Um, and, and we just kind of helped open a door, maybe, you know, maybe, but, um, you know, it was there. Um, okay, so you worked at Brooklyn College, I think, what, close to 12 years, right? Uh, 11 um, years, 2008, uh, a long time, 10 years, a long time. A long time. Um, how did you have the courage, right? How many, I mean, I know there's people right now who have jobs that pay the bills, and it's scary to leave that stable job, you know, to pursue your dream or to take that risk. How did you have that courage to, to go for it? That is, <laughs> that is a great, great question because um, I was earning great money at, at Brooklyn College in the Office of Communications Marketing. I had a great um, benefits plan, great pension plan, um, great hours. I, I was working nine to five Monday through Friday with Fridays off in the summer. 
so it was like great but i still understood that it was um not my purpose um and that if i was going to um make my purpose manifest i had to take some risks that were really scary such as not having a steady paycheck and um maybe not having health benefits for a time and certainly um not at the at the at the um at that current moment having um a pension that would be i would be continually contributing to but i knew that um I didn't do six years of, of school to then um, sort of rest on my laurels. Um, I committed to writing this, this book, The Prophets, in my um, first year of the MFA program when Stacy Derasmo, my fiction tutorial professor, sent us out into the world to find objects that a character we were thinking about would possess. And I, along Flatbush Avenue, um, a pile of garbage bags sitting on the sidewalk waiting, waiting, ready for sanitation to pick them up the next day, found a pair of shackles. And I knew I was thinking about an enslaved character. And I took that as a sign that it, I should be writing this book. And so I've been work, I had worked on this book for 14 years um, since that first semester. And that was the thing that gave me the most joy that made me feel like the most like I was fulfilling a dream and my purpose. And I could not um, commit fully to that and also work full time at Brooklyn College. One had to give. And so when I realized that I had a completed manuscript and that um, I let some people, including my husband, and um, one of my good friends, who is also a Brooklyn College alum, Osvaldo Oyola, read it and give me their feedback and um, tell me that there was something here. I realized it's time for me to move to the next stage of this. I have to show it to a literary agent and see if it's true that this is something worth publishing. And when I met my agent, PJ Mark from Janklo and Nesbitt, and he told me, this is remarkable. I said, okay, I am going to commit 100% to this, even if it means I have to leave behind um, stability. Um, and that is not, I, I, I find myself privileged to be able to have done that because not everybody is in a position to do it, but I saved assiduously. Um, I did not spend a lot of money on anything. I saved all as much money as I possibly could. Um, and I had um, a backup plan in the, in the event that um, my leaving would um, fail. So I made sure that I talked it over with my husband, talked it over with my family and friends, and then made the decision to um, leave and pursue being an author full time. Excellent. So I'm going to ask a couple of more questions about your career, and then I'm, we're going to go into a couple of questions around being a writer and your book. Um, so what would you say? I mean, I, I, it seems like you've had a lot, again, a lot of bumps across along the way, but what would you say has been the biggest kind of disappointment or letdown, and, and how did you overcome um, that moment? Um, the biggest disappointment. Um, career-wise, I guess. Career-wise, I would say the biggest disappointment was my, my inability to trust that these careers that I was looking into um, that were not what my purpose was, that I was relying on those things, that I was saying, to heck with my dream, let me be practical and do this thing that I know I'm going to hate. Um, and that even if I do it well, I know that um, I'm going to eventually come to a place of bitterness because I did not um, follow my dream. I followed my fear. Um, that is, um, and that's happened to me several times. 
So I would say those are the biggest career disappointments. When, when I follow my fear instead of my glory, that is when I am, I think I am the biggest disappointment to myself. Wow, Some, someone wrote that's deep. Um, so I, again, I think your words are resonating with people, inspiring them. I'm, I'm sure there'd be a few people that are revisiting sort of their, what their um, path is and whether they're following their heart and their purpose. Um, so, but I will also say, I think things also happen for a reason and, and who knows, you know, in terms of like stars aligning, you know, had you pursued this earlier or at a different stage, whether it would have, it would have been the right time or, or things would have worked out. Um, so you've had a lot of success as well. So what are things that you think have contributed to where you are today and, and your success? Um, hands down, my education at Brooklyn College um, really prepared me in ways um, predictable and unpredictable for um, what I'm doing now. Um, so I have, I have to thank both the English department and the Africana Studies department for relentlessly educating me um, in, in a myriad of ways. Also, um, I had the great fortune of going to Brooklyn College when the core curriculum was the core curriculum, where it was one through 10 and you had to take these courses, even though they were not in your major, um, because it broadened my, my perspective in ways that I could never have imagined. I mean, I didn't think, why, would I, why was I taking geology? But I loved it. You know, why was I taking sociology? But I loved it. And so um, it, it's, it's really hands down my, my, my education at Brooklyn College that really prepared me um, skillfully to be the best writer that I could possibly be from a, a, a ton of different perspectives, not simply from just English in terms of getting the, the, the grammar right and, and stuff like that, but to be thinking deeply about um, identity, about um, oppression, about politics, about the world that I would like to live in, about how we go about making the world a better place than, than, the, than the condition it's currently in, um, about forming community. All of those things were, were, were reinforced at Brooklyn College. Excellent. So i come and ask you a couple of series of questions about being a writer, then we have a few more, and then we're gonna open it up to the questions people submitted and, and the chat. So there's a lot of buzz around your book. Um, I know a lot of us follow you on Twitter I and mean, you're, you're, you know, you're hot, right? Um, of all these great moments that have happened, what would you say, if you can narrow it down to one, what's made you most proud uh, um, up to this point? Um, I have to say that um, the, the positive response to the book from critics and readers alike has been utterly surprising. I did not expect this response. But the thing that has been um, the most outstanding to me was that I received an email from a young Black queer man who is 17. And he said, Mr. Jones, your book is the book that I've been waiting to read. That was the moment for me that I got choked up because that was the reason why I was writing this book. Because um, it was a book that I had not seen. I, I had not seen this book. And so um, Toni Morrison, who is one of my um, greatest literary inspirations, said, if you cannot find the book you wish to read, then you must write it. And though I was terrified to write it because it was such uncharted territory, I said, I'm going to write this book. I don't care how long it takes me. And it took me 14 years. And um, I will be in one week from today, I will be 50 years old. And that is, this is me publishing my first book at, at, the, at basically the age of 50. And had I allowed all of that to sort of hold me back, it's as you said, Natalia, this was the perfect moment because I don't think an 18 year old Robert or 20 year old Robert could have written this book. It had to be a 14 year process and it had to come out when I'm at this age because there's just so much 
in terms of lived experience that I've gone through that made what I was able to write here possible. And I, I know there's again many colleagues on and, and I think all of us are excited about your success because you're just, you're such a good person, you know, like just a mm-hmm. humble and, and a good character. And, and so we're, we're all like rooting for you, for, for your success. Um, so I'm sure there's a few aspiring writers in the in the group. So for those that aspire to become a writer, what what kind of tips do you have in terms of hopefully one day they can get their book published? I think the hardest thing about being a writer is actually writing. Like you know, it's one thing to say that you're a writer, but it's another thing to actually put in that physical labor of the act of writing. Um, when I was uh, working in the communications department, it was difficult for me to write because um, I was working nine to five, and then I was writing that whole time um, for a for for the institution, and so a lot of my creative energy was being drained and and used for that writing, and I wasn't paying as much attention <laughs> to um, the manuscript, and so what I did was develop. A, a ritual of, of a kind. I would get up at three o'clock in the morning every single morning because I, I, I think of that as the magic hour or the witching hour where New York City or Brooklyn is at its most quiet and the voices, the creative voices, the ancestors or whatever you might call it are the loudest. And I am most inspired at that time. And I would get up at three o'clock, sit in front of my computer and write for one hour. I committed to write for one hour every night. I go back to sleep at four, wake up at six, shower, get ready to go to work. And then sometimes I would write on my commute. Um, I, I would take the B44 or the, um, the two train in and I'd be writing on the train or the bus. Um, so what writers have to understand is that um, writing requires a particular kind of muscle that you have to exercise. And you have to commit through, even when you're tired, you're feeling lazy, when you don't have time. Toni Morrison once said that she used to write around the edges of the day. She was raising two kids and working full time. And she had to do the same thing, find the, the, the edges of the day to write. You have to do it. Um, and it, it's gonna be, it's not easy. It, it seems like it's so easy because all you're doing is putting pen to paper, but it is so hard to commit to um, a big project like a novel in particular, but to commit to the idea of writing as um, art, writing as um, I'm going to get this done, writing as one day someone is gonna read this and find it to be of value and writing as um, sticking with it because so many writers will start a project and never finish it. Um, so my, my advice to all writers is commit to it. Um, by any means necessary. And I think that's that's great advice for, for anyone in any um, position or any it field, um, because I think there are no shortcuts. You know, sometimes somebody might look at you, oh, wow, he's, you know, but it's the journey that you've been through and that commitment every day um, to, to make it happen. And, and that I think applies to any anything that you want to reach, you have to commit daily and, and be patient you know, for it to come through. Uh, so we're in a pandemic. So how did that kind of impact the process, promoting your book? Like how, how is that different from had you had a traditional way of launching your book? Um, it is quite a solitary experience in that I can't do um, traditional book tours and things of that nature. Everything that I've done for this book has been through like, uh, Zoom or Skype or something of that um, nature. Everything has been virtual. Um, so for, for most of this time, I haven't felt like an author because I haven't gone into a bookstore and had a line of people waiting for me to autograph their and personalize their books. And I haven't been able to go into a bookstore and read and have people ask me questions about the book. Um, in person. I have done all of that stuff um, in some way, shape, or form virtually. Um, I've gone to um, my local bookstore, which is Greenlight, to um, sign books 
that people have ordered um, and personalize them that way. But it's, it's kind of not the same when you're sitting in a room alone and um, you have a mask on and you're signing these books based on what's written on a piece of paper that someone emailed. Um, it, it's not the same. And, um, but at the same time, it, it's still great to know that people are still, particularly in this, in this time that we're living in, connecting to, to the work. Okay, so I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to turn it to Lisa so that we can ask some of the questions that came in from our attendees. And then I have a few questions at the end that we can close with. Um, so we all know success is not easy for anyone. Um, and that's actually something that I don't know why it kind of came to me later in my time at Brooklyn College that for students, when they see someone successful, they may not realize how much they struggled, right? Usually your, your bio and your, your resume doesn't show when you got fired and terminated and you didn't get the job. Um, but we know, we all know anybody who's made it a countered, you know, these kind of situations. So success is not easy. And the fact that you were an older student and a black gay male, um, that adds a little extra, right, challenges to that. So what advice do you have for students and alumni who are feeling a little discouraged and you know, kind of feel for whatever reason, something's holding them back? Um, how, do you, how do they push through that? What advice do you have for them? Don't despair because um, despair is a, um, a paralyzing emotion. It, um, you start talking yourself into um, what you can't do. Um, so in addition to being um, black and gay, um, I was also recently diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And it um, terrified me because um, for anyone who knows, MS is a debilitating disease where your, um, your immune system is attacking your nervous system and um, results in like really unpredictable symptoms. So some days, when I was writing the novel, I couldn't physically write because whenever I touched something, it felt like I was touching fire because my, my nervous system was just a wreck. And so I would use my phone to speak into it to, to, and because I couldn't type it. I would speak into it when I, when I wanted to write particular things. I say all of that to say that we all face some sort of challenges we all have these sorts of insecurities about what we're able to accomplish or not. But we must remember that we are all here for a particular purpose. And we all know deep down inside what that purpose is. We may have been denying it our whole lives. We may have been ignoring it our entire life, but we know what that purpose is. And the moment we decide, yes, I am going to pursue it, as that man on Oprah Winfrey said, don't think about the last step. Think about the next step you have to take in order to make that dream a reality. And you can do it. I know it's hard. I know it's hard to get yourself psyched up to you know, just do it because you're thinking, gosh, I'm 40 or I'm 50 or it's too late. Or and it's never too late. As long as you have breath in your body, it is never too late. Beautiful, and, and I think we all need to hear that. Um, you know, when I was in, I think it was, Ele no, when I was, when my previous job before I came to Brooklyn College, which sort of happened by accident, someone had asked me, you know, what was my dream job? And I said, if I could have my dream job, I'd be a motivational speaker. Like I'd be just inspiring and motivating people. And in some form, that's what I do at, at, at Brooklyn College. So I, I agree, a lot of times, you know what you're interested in and what your passion is. And then just sometimes, you know, whether it's family or life obligations, it sort of just um, derails you a little bit from what you really want to do. So um, I'm gonna turn it to Lisa. So what we're gonna do, she's gonna ask some questions that came in uh, for the people that pre-registered. But um, for those that do have questions, if you could put them in the chat, um, Lisa's gonna ask those as well. So Lisa, take it away. Thanks so much. Um... This has been such a great session, I have to say. I've, I've been on mute, but I've been ooing and aahing on my own. 
And Robert, I have to say, I did not share the questions that alums asked before. Um, however, we have so many writers ourselves here who asked, how did you stay motivated? Um, and you've really done a beautiful job of answering that. How did you know your purpose? So thank you for already answering a lot of questions that people had. That was wonderful. Um, but we do have more, certainly. Um, one is, your current novel is acclaimed, to say the least. Um, but of all the work you've done over your many years, what has been your favorite piece of work that you've written? I had the um, the wonderful opportunity right before um, I um, resigned from Brooklyn College's um, communications department to write a story about Victoria Cruz, an alum of the college who um, is a transgender woman um, of color who was at the Stonewall Uprising. Um, and I got to hear her first person account of um, what that was like what it means to be a transgender woman in this current climate and the ways in which she um, uses her activism to um, advocate on behalf of transgender women everywhere. Um, it was like meeting a celebrity when, when I got to meet her. Um, she is one of the most wonderful and inspiring people I have ever met. And that story will remain with me for the rest of my days, I, I just was um, awestruck by, by her um, courage and her resilience. That's wonderful, thank you so much. Um, another question actually starts by noting the praise that you're receiving right now, um, but they're wondering if you ever have faced harsh criticism in your career, specifically your writing, and how you were able to just stay confident through it and trust yourself and your gift. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have faced um, harsh criticism. Um, I, there was an incident when I was in the MFA program where um, someone said something, um, I, I want to say racially charged, but the correct term would actually be racist um, to me about um, the danger of me becoming a Black writer because I was writing about Black things. Um, and I was highly offended and almost felt as though I should stop writing about black things and do as this person was saying and write about things that were not black, I suppose. Um, and I didn't have the language then to say to that person, but you are writing about white things. And, and why is it bad that I'm writing about black things? Um, why is white being considered the default state of nature? Why am I being considered as uh, Toni Morrison would say, you know, you're an American and everybody else has to hyphenate. Why, why is it that way? Um, and while I was um, sort of um, depressed behind what um, this student said, something in me said, but you have to keep writing dis despite all of that. You have to keep writing. You, you have to because this is your purpose. And not everyone's gonna like what you're writing. You know, the, the nature of art is that everyone has a different opinion about it. Some people are gonna actually hate what you're writing and you can't let that stop you. You, you have to continue writing as you see the world, um, um, being a witness um, as James Baldwin would say um, for um, the things that you feel need um, uh, testimony to be shared about. Um, and that is what pushed me through. Um, I even as a writer, now as a novelist, I've, I've received harsh criticism. Not all of the criticism has been um, positive. And my feeling is, okay. Um, some people read it and they get something completely different out of it. Once the book is out of my hands, it is up to the reader to decide what they see there. M my intention is almost beside the point. I know what, I know what my intention was, but how people receive that is up to how they receive it. It's, it's their own life experiences informing them. And so I praise both the praise and the criticism. It's part of the process. Well, I'm so happy you're able to move through it and then we get to read your beautiful work. Um, and I actually, some alums have read the novel and in the question submission area, there was a lot of 
I, I don't have a question, but I loved his book. Tell him I loved it. So people are loving it. Um, we had someone else actually, oh, actually this is odd. The question I'm about to read is also in the chat. People are wondering if you can share a little bit about your research process. Yes, so I had a really long research process. But the great thing about it was that because Africana studies was my minor, so much of the reading that was required for me to know about this period in history was a part of my, my assignment as a, as a um, student. So I had, I had already had so many of the texts required, um, such as um, Frederick Douglass's narrative or Harriet Jacobs' narrative, um, even some of the early um, Harlem Renaissance works, which I used to, to think about this time period. But in terms of all of that, that canon, that body of work, what dawned on me and what actually led me to thinking about writing a book like The Prophets was that prior to the Harlem Renaissance, there's almost no mention of Black queer people. Um, the earliest reference that I could find at the time was Wallace Thurman's The Black or the Berry, which was written in 1929. Um, and before that, you see little hints and signs of Black queerness always in the context of sexual assault or rape, never in the context of love. And that was what I wanted to write about. I wanted to write about love. Um, and so I had to go to um, a different kind of text. I had to go to the oral histories of continental Africans to understand what was the role of queerness in um, Africa in the time before um, European colonization and Christian missionaries coming into communities to convert um, and found these wonderful, wonderful stories about um, indigenous Africans who thought about gender identity and gender and sexuality in ways that are so incredibly modern and advanced for people that we think of now as primitive. They were way ahead of us. The, the, the ways we're thinking about gender and gender identity now, they were thinking about it like that thousands of years ago. And that is where I found sort of the faith and the foundation to um, go ahead and write this book and write about these things in particular. And that was um, part of the research process. I just want to mention Ronnie um, wrote a beautiful message and she has to leave. So I want to make sure you have a chance to read some of the messages in the chat because again, a lot of love coming around for you. Um, so. I love Ronnie Natov. Ronnie Natov is my favorite person on earth. And she was one of the people who um, gave me the most confidence. She believed in my ability more than I believed in myself. And I am forever indebted to her for that. Aww. Beautiful. She's sending you kisses. Oh, <laughs> beautiful. You're making me choke up myself. Um, okay, so we have a few questions in the chat. Um, so you want to ask them or should I ask them? I actually have just one or two still that were submitted. Um, okay, and one is more, more fan love for Robert. This alum was actually introduced to you via your son of Baldwin social media platform. And, you know, she said that your voice on social issues through that platform sang to her. Um, she's wondering if you plan to continue your social media engagement and, you know, if so or if not, how that helped you as a novelist using, those, using social media. Um, great questions. At some point, um, social media becomes noise and um, it, it gets harder and harder to um, keep your messaging um, pure, um, keep it, um, keep conversations on track um, and um, sort of avoid the obvious trolls and things of that nature. So I don't think, I, I do think Son of Baldwin has a, a expiration date um, and that I will um, maybe move this platform to, to something else um, where I can um, maintain it in, with um, more control. But um, I do want to say that Son of Baldwin played a significant role in how I wrote this book because, because of social media, I got to meet people that I may not have met had, not, had I not had this platform. So 
I actually got to speak to um, Black queer people from Brazil, um, a Black transgender woman from Zimbabwe, um, Black people from um, Britain and Nigeria and Ghana and Panama, all over the world to get like a really global perspective about things like race and gender and sexuality in ways that my Western education had not prepared me for. Because, you know, I had assumed the way we think about race and gender and sexuality is the way the whole world thinks about it and was um, quickly informed that no, that's not the case, that all of these ways that we're thinking about it are human made constructions, that they don't spring up out of nature, that everyone has their own particular, particular way of looking at all of these issues, all of these identities. And that really um, educated me in terms of how I should be thinking about these characters that I'm writing about, how to broaden them as well and give them dimension. Um, one person actually did bring up your character development and how what, what a wonderful job you do there and wondered if you're ever tempted to do, you know, a spinoff with certain characters or if, and even if when you're writing, if that distracts you, if you ever, you know, you have your main, you know, central characters and you ever kind of get lost perhaps in, in other ones along the way. Let, let me tell you, um, there are several characters who did not make the final cut because I, like, I was getting caught up in writing all of these characters. Additionally, one character in particular threatened to take over the entire novel, and that's the character of Maggie for anyone who's read the book. Um, Maggie is the sort of um, the matron of um, the, the enslaved matron of the plantation um, who it plays a pivotal role in the book. Um, she was the character that talked to me most and who I felt most comfortable writing and who I could have made an entire book about um, if, if I didn't realize that I, this book needed to be about Samuel and Isaiah and, and their love. Um, but um, yes, and I do think about these characters. Um, these characters continue to live with me, particularly Maggie um, and a, another character from the earlier African parts of the book, King Akusa, who is a woman king in a pre-colonial African society. Um, and I have thought about the idea of a prequel or a sequel, but I think this story is, um, I think it's done. Um, I, I've spent 14 years on it. I think it's done and complete. And I am um, thinking about the next novel, which I hope does not take 14 years. That is um, actually more, um, I, I actually see one of my old classmates, Robert Chapman, in the room here. <laughs> um, that is actually more, and he, he actually knows that I've been working on this book for a very long time. Um, um, I'm working on a book that's more contemporary, um, some, exploring some other ideas that I wanna kind of talk about. That's great. And that actually, our last question that was submitted in advance was, what are you working on next? So thank you for answering that for us already. Um, I can move on to some of the, the chat questions. One is, you know, everyone has writer's block and how do you move past the creative wall? Great question. Um, I forced myself past writer's block because what writer's block really is is I'm not able to write, what, what writers are saying when they say they have writer's block is I'm not able to write to the level that I think I should be writing and so I can't write. I just wrote, even if it was something that I would utter, ultimately erase, I just wrote it anyway. Even if it was a terrible sentence, I wrote it anyway because that's how you get past the block because You'll, you'll write something out you think at that moment is, is not worthy of being written, but it will provide you the, the sort of platform you need to get to the next thing that you write, which also might not be as good, but then it gets you to the next thing that might be better. And so um, I write irrespective of the fact that I don't feel the creative spark to write, or I feel like what I'm writing isn't good enough, or if I feel like, what's the point of writing it if I can't write it at the top of my level? I, I write irrespective of all of those things. And I think that is how you sort of work through writer's block. That's great, thank you. Um, Andre is asking if you have any thoughts on, conver on converting the novel into a play. Um, 
I have not thought about converting it into a play. However, I am in talks with Hollywood producers to convert it into a movie. So um, cross your fingers. If everything works out, you will, you will likely be seeing the profits um, on the big screen. What? That is awesome. And, and Lisa and I both get starring roles, right? Somewhere. Yes. <laughs> you see how great we are, how charismatic we are on Zoom. I mean. That's excellent. We're, we're really like just so happy to see you take off like this. It's incredible. Yeah. Thank you. Shout um, out to Ashley Brockington. I see another one of my, my old friends. Uh, that, it's like them. a reunion. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Virginia from my office is also here and she tells me frequently how much she misses you. <laughs> so, you love, are Virginia and I worked very closely on commencement. I, I love Virginia. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, you're missed and loved for sure. I and, think and we had it. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, and I, I mean, the fact that all these people are here for you, again, just speaks to like what a, a great person you are. And, and that's what makes me even more excited about your success. Like if you were, would have been a jerk, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. none of your former coworkers <laughs> would be here. You know what I'm saying? So um, I think that just everyone in their bones is so excited for you and happy for you. I wanna, I wanna give a shout out to one of your staff members, Natalia, Michael Sereo, who um, I know happens to be an amazing artist himself. And I want to keep reminding him of how amazing an artist he is so that he understands that it's his time too. So Michael, do what you're supposed to be doing. But stay no at the pressure. Magner Center, right though? Like, <laughs> just kidding. No, I, 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 I support. Yeah, no, I always support people, you know, uh, I, I never want to hold anybody back if, if there's something else. I'm kidding. He, he, you know, and I think, again, a lot of people need to hear that message. Um, okay, sorry, Lisa. No, I mean, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just loving this session so much. <laughs> um, Robert, we had a few more questions in the chat. One is you talked about your formative years and Gravesend and Bensonhurst, how it shaped your life, and specifically, they're wondering how it shaped your writing as well. Um, I didn't know what race was until I moved to Bensonhurst as a kid. I, I lived in Bensonhurst Gravesend um, starting at age six. Um, I didn't know that I was black. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. Like I didn't, I wasn't aware of color in terms of, ra in a racial sense. Um, I just thought we were all people until someone called me a racial slur at age six. Um, and then when I asked my mother what that meant, um, they called me a jigaboo. And I said to my mother what that meant and she started crying. I sort of intuited that it was something bad and that it had something to do with my skin color. Um, and that's when I first realized what race was. And because race is such a troubling um, creation or, or construct, construct for me, it's always been um, a subject in my writing. And I think that is how Bensonhurst sort of shaped who I am as a writer. I'm always thinking very critically about race in addition to gender, gender identity, sexuality, and other things, but it started with race. Um, I was two blocks away in 1989 when Yusuf Hawkins was murdered in Bensonhurst. I was only two blocks away at a friend's house, uh, a friend of mine who was white, um, whose mother, and it, it's so weird how this operated because it, it was like the neighborhood understood what happened very quickly. And his mother came in from outside and she said, Robert, we have to take you home. Um, and I didn't know what was happening until I got home and then it was on the news. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, so, um, these of experiences um, really shaped how I think about the written word and its purpose. That's powerful, thank you. Um, I think the last question from chat is, um, what advice you have for someone affected by imposter syndrome? Let me tell you, um, you are looking at somebody with imposter syndrome. Um, no matter 
how much praise the book receives, I focus on the negative every single time. No matter how many times somebody tells me that I'm a good writer, I, I can't internalize it. Um, no matter how much praise the book's book receives i always feel i always feel as though um people are just trying to be nice to me and they really hate it all of that is a symptom of imposter syndrome that i have re resolved that is always going to be a part of me um, i'm 50 years old i have been trying for 50 years to move past this idea and i can't so what i've resigned myself to believing is that there's always going to be a part of me which I call the inner opponent that is going to make me question my own um, talents and skills. And despite that, I should write anyway. Um, and that's, it, it, it's, it's just as simple as that. I should try to do my best at writing in spite of all the voices in my head that are telling me you're a terrible writer, stop writing. I just let them, let them talk and I write anyway. That is the only way I know to get past imposter syndrome. Well, it's working well, I think. <laughs> you certainly are. I mean, you're writing and your, your work is just, it's incredible. So we're so happy to have you. Um, Natalia, I think I got through the chat questions. You can let me know if I missed one. I, I, um, I saw one that, that I'll ask, because um, if you didn't catch it, but I, I wanted to say, I think there's two things that I'm taking away from today is one, you had a lot of angels and support along the way, right? Because I think, again, sometimes people think that if you ask for help or lean on other people, it's a sign of weakness, which in reality, none of us get to where we are or where we want to be without the mentors and the support and the guidance. So I think that's important. And then that even the most successful, best people are insecure and, and unsure and have fear and doubt. But the difference is, is that you push, push through it. Like you said, it's not that you ha don't have fear. It's just that you go past the fear to get to where you want to be. And I think, because I think sometimes when, when we do have that self doubt, we think we're alone. We think it's a reflection of weakness. And I think it's important for everyone to see that it's not, and, and it doesn't mean you're not successful or can't be. It's just, you have to accept that we all feel that. And I think some people you're being honest to share and not everyone always shares that they feel that way. So I think that's, important that you know for us to all hear that message thank you so the question that uh, i mean it's it, it is hard on the chats to keep keep through but the question that uh was missed was um and i don't know if, if you feel comfortable answering it is how can you discover your purpose and passion if you don't know it and if it's not as obvious as yours in terms of you knew since you were young you wanted to do writing you know even though I always known that I liked writing and that I thought of myself as good at it, I never really understood it as my purpose until way later. Um, when I had the benefit of um, retrospect to say, this is what I've been doing the most consistently. This is the thing that has been bringing me the most joy. This is the thing where I feel most excellent where I'm operating at my highest self, um, why am I not pursuing this? What's holding me back from pursuing this thing? But I didn't know that it was my purpose until I saw that, um, that Oprah Winfrey show and that guy said, you know, you know what it is. And I sort of sat back and meditated and thought about it. Like, what is my purpose? What could it be? And, and then it sort of, popped into my head that it was, oh, it's the writing. I have these books and books of poetry and these books and, and spiral notebooks filled with stories I was writing as a kid. And um, my first attempt at, at a novel when I was 16, all of these things, it was the accumulation of those experiences that led me to understand that that was my purpose. It wasn't like I knew from the jump that that was my purpose. I had to look back and reflect and think 
and then finally accept that that was my purpose because um, I had no one else telling me that I could actually think about this as um, a profession or a way of life or an art form that was central to who I was as a person. Um, and that is when I talk to other people who say they pursue their purpose, that is generally how it comes to them. It's usually either something they feel most natural doing, something that brings them unlimited joy, even if um, it is a high paying profession or it um, doesn't, it's not glamorous uh, um, or things like that. It still brings them untold joy where they wake up in the morning happy to do it. Um, that they don't feel like, oh God, I have to go into this place again. I wish I could call out sick or I wish I could do something else. It's usually that thing that makes you feel like it makes your heart skip a beat. I don't know what that might be for people it, and it's, it's so different for everybody, but it was the thing that made me feel like, almost like um, divine in a sense. Um, it, it's hard to describe, but it, it made me feel whole. That's what it was. It made me, writing made me feel whole. And I ignored that wholeness for the halfness because of all the other things that people were telling me I should be doing instead of what I, I should have intuited. Well, maybe I should not have intuited. I had to come to it. I'm like, we all have to come to it. Okay, I see a couple of more questions that at, were added to the chat. And if anyone has any additional ones, um, please do. We have about 20 more minutes and I just have one kind of last question I'll ask. Um, the question comes from Mike. Did you have a, thor a thorough outline of your story before you started writing or did you start writing and then the story developed organically? I started writing and the story developed organically. I started um, writing from the perspective of character. And I, what I wanted to make sure that I did was that I made these characters feel as real and full and dimensional as I possibly could. And in doing so, they began to sort of shape plot. And then from the plot being shaped, they also helped shape structure. Um, and so everything began with character. And I did not have an outline. I did not do all the traditional things that writers are supposed to do, draw maps and you know do all of these things so that you know what your plantation looks like. I moved from memory um, because when I was a, a child, I um, would visit my elder family members, my great aunts and great grandmother and such who grew up in, in South Carolina. And they lived on a plantation that in which they on which they was enslaved and given a parcel of land um, um, after emancipation. And I played on this plantation when I was a little kid and didn't realize it was a plantation. But once I discovered that it was, I drew on that very heavily to inform what a plantation would look like, what it would feel like, what it would smell like, um, all of those things. Um, and, and, and sort of wrote from um, what um, my ancestors would probably call blood memory to sort of, um, craft something that felt real. Um, but very little of it was um, structured in the classical sense where, you know, I was writing an outline and saying here are the, who the characters are going to be and this is when they're going to speak. I sort of just threw it all together and then rearranged things based on um, um, conversations with my editor or my agent um, and, and things like that. Speaking of agent, there's a question about how did you find your agent? Great question. Um, I found PJ by hitting up friends of mine who were published writers um, because I did not know how to find an, how to find a literary agent. Um, I learned in my last semester of the MFA program that you should like Google your favorite writers and, and, and find out who they're their agents are. But um, at the time, Google wasn't as robust as it is now. Um, and so that information was not readily available through a Google search. Um, so what I wound up doing was asking 
um, my um, friends who had been published, who's your agent? Did you like them? Um, did you find them helpful in terms of um, understanding your vision in terms of what you're writing and getting you with the right publisher. And then um, I wound up talking to the agents that um, my friends recommended and found the agent that was the best one for me. And that was PJ. Um, and what's important for writers to know is that what your agent does is advocate on your behalf when you're ready to send your manuscript to a publisher. So they're the ones that's going to say, that, that are gonna represent your vision and, and argue on behalf of your vision and ensure that you are set up with a publisher who's not gonna make you, for example, um, sign with them and then say, okay, we wanna change your whole entire book now. Um, the agent is the person that ensures that you don't run into situations like that and that you're in the most comfortable and um, mutually um, beneficial relationships possible. So it's really important that you and your agent vibe and understand one another. All right, any final questions? I am trying to save, I'm, gonna, I'm saving the chat so I could send it to you, Robert, so you could have it and read it Thank patiently you. later. All right, so if no one has any questions, feel free to generate them. Because um, my last question, I like to ask this question pretty much at any event, is what do you know now that you, you wish you knew when you were um, younger? What do I know now that I wish I knew when I was younger? I know now that the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, the obstacles and the achievements are all part of the process. Um, something isn't successful simply because you got to it on a straight path without any um, bumps. The bumps are important. Um, they help you to understand certain things. They help you to recalibrate. Um, they help you to determine whether or not this is something that you're going to continue to pursue. Because if you can get over a bump and you still want to do that thing, then you know you are destined to do it, that it is something that you are supposed to do. And as a kid, I thought anytime you ran into an obstacle, you were supposed to give up because that obstacle wouldn't be there if you were supposed to do it. And now I realize that the obstacle is there um, to help you learn something. Um, it's valuable. Um, and I wish I knew that when I was younger. And there is one question about any advice on pitching. Pitching. Um, let's see. Yes, you should, you should be able to describe your story quickly. So when I was pitching The Prophets, I said, The Prophets is, a, is about two enslaved young men on a plantation in Mississippi who are in love. And their love um, transforms all of those around them, whether enslaved or enslaver, and reverberates throughout time to an earlier period in African history. And then, so that's what the story is about. And then you should also know, well, why are you writing this story? And I had that ready too. I am writing this story because the black queer figure prior to the Harlem Renaissance has been erased from history and I wish to reinscribe them into the cultural narrative by discussing um, loves that surely existed, even if they were erased. So you should, you should have an elevator pitch for what your book is about. And then as you, as the author, why you're writing about this particular thing. Quickly, you should, you should, you should be able to say those things relatively quickly. Okay, another question that came in. How did you overcome the trauma and discouragement from family and bullies? Um, because writing became my escape from the bullies. That is where I was creating worlds in which I was powerful and loved and um, had friends and um, 
was experiencing the things that I would have liked to experience when I was a teen teenager, but could not. Writing became a respite and a safe space. So um, in some sense, the more bullied I was, the more I retreated into the world of writing and books, um, which, you know, that's one of the ways in which you become a better writer is you read. The more you read, the better the writer you become. So those were the places I um, found um, comfort and safety um, during those times. Um, there's a question. Uh, how did you persist in the face of environments that lacked appreciation for your experiences, vision, and talents? Um, that was really hard because um, particularly when they were happening in academic settings, because you're basing your whole worth on the idea that this work you're producing is good. And here you have people who can't even see it much less recognize it as good. Um, and you have to somehow continue to write thinking that possibly what you're writing isn't any good. That is when um, purpose kicks in. Because for me, it was no matter what anyone was saying, good or bad, I had to write. It was almost um, compulsive. I had to write and nothing no one was gonna say was gonna discourage me from writing. Even if they thought it was offensive, if they thought it was um, subpar, um, whatever it was, I had a almost excessive compulsive um, need to get these things onto the page, um, the, these things I was imagining, these things I was feeling. And so that's how I got through um, those circumstances. All right, so Andre in my office has a fun question. Um, uh, I'm sure he's envisioning a big check that you got from your, from your book. So he wants to know, did you treat yourself to something? Like what was that kind of like, you know, I guess gift to yourself when you knew, okay, this is successful? It's important to note um, that uh, the process of me publishing my novel is um, one that is um, unusual, um, or maybe not unusual, but doesn't happen quite as often, is that my, my manuscript went to auction, which means that there were several publishers who wanted to publish it, and so they had to bid on it, and, not, and it usually goes to the highest bidder. But I did not choose the highest bidder because my gut told me that the highest bidder was going to do the thing that I feared, which was buy the book and then tell me I had to change everything about it. So although they bid as much money as I had ever been off, I've never seen that amount of money before in my entire life. I said no to them. And I went with the, um, a, a publisher who bid below them. And I did that because it was really, really important for me to be with someone that I felt understood the vision of what I was trying to accomplish. That said, it was, it was a sizable amount that I received as an advance and I did not spend a dime of it. I put it all in the bank. I actually opened the CD and had it locked away for a couple of years. Um, I, I always think maybe because um, my grandfather was a child of the depression and he raised my mother and my mother raised me is that I'm always thinking about what would happen if you don't have any money left, if you get kicked out, if you know, you're know you running out of food, whatever. So my mind is always operating in depression era mode. So I'm not a big spender. I'm a big saver. So I like to save money. And I, I, so I didn't treat myself to anything big at all. Um, my husband threw me a book release party, which was nice. Um, socially distanced about 20 of my closest friends. It was outdoors and we were all in masks. Um, that was the biggest event that happened. But in terms of um, big ticket items or, or trips or anything like that, I, I, I don't feel comfortable spending money in that way. So I, it's, it's all in the bank. <laughs> now, if you get the movie deal, 
<laughs> what would you buy? Because that's that would be pretty a lot of zeros, right? So what would you buy if, if that comes through? Any wish? I always wanted to live in Ditmas Park. I would want to buy a house in Ditmas Park. Ditmas Park is one of the most beautiful neighborhoods I have ever seen in my life with those big colonial homes and the, the big haunting trees and the, um, the, the blocks that just stretch forever and have like these middle medians in it that makes you think that, you know, all the rich people live there. <laughs> I think it's just beautiful. And I would love to buy a house in Ditmas Park. Okay, excellent. We hope we're all wishing for that for you. So we have two questions, oh, an important one. People are asking, where can I get a signed copy of The Prophets? Um, and are you planning to do any small in-person talks? If so, where? So how do they find out more about your talks and things? Um, if you visit sonofbaldwin.com, there is a list of where you can get my book, including um, personalized copies. If you would like me to you know, say to whomever, um, thank you for your support and then my autograph. Or if you just want autographed copies, go to sonofbaldwin.com and follow the instructions there. Um, and you can also find out um, where my next events are happening at sonofbaldwin.com. So far, we don't have any in-person events planned because of the pandemic. But as soon as things are safer, um, I'm looking forward to um, doing in-person events. Um, my um, novel is being released in Spain on the 22nd. Then it's being released in France in September. And I am happy to say that it's going to be published in another 18 countries in 2022, including Israel, Turkey, um, the Netherlands, Sweden, Germany, Italy, and the list goes on and on. I'm so grateful, um, but I'm hoping also to be able to travel to those places to um, get to see um, readers in person and to see the lovely countries that um, the book is going to be published in. That would be amazing. So I did get one private question I'm gonna ask, and then I think that will be running our time up. Um, how can you write about painful areas of your life without feeling guilt, especially about family members who are conservative? That is a, that is an excellent question. Um, when I was writing The Prophets, for example, I'm writing about very painful, a, a very painful part of the country's history. Um, and what I had to remember was, um, but they made it through. And that means there had to be moments of joy. And I have to give as much um, time to joy as I give to pain. Um, otherwise, I'm not telling the truth. And so that is how I would approach writing about my own life. Um, I would say that there were many painful moments in my own life that might implicate some people that I love. But there were also moments of joy. And so if I tell, if I talk about the moments of joy too, then I'm telling the truth. And though I might feel guilty about revealing that testimony, it is my testimony to tell. Um, I have a right to say what happened to me um, um, because that is, that is what testimony is and testimony requires witnesses. Um, I would say to anybody who wants to write about their lives and they fear um, implicating other people, you have to do it. Um, other people are implicated. Um, and it's always, it always stings to be implicated in, in somebody else's harm. You feel bad because we're all, we're all the heroes in our own story. But one of the things that James Baldwin taught me was that innocence is a crime because there, there are no innocents other than you know infants, babies, small children are innocent. But the rest of us, we have all done harm in some way, somebody, even if we don't know it. And the way that we sort of get past that is to confront it and make amends. And when, you're, when you tell your story and it implicates someone, their response in an ideal world should be, how can I make amends? 
not to feel, why did you tell that about me? And, and how dare you, you know, that you shouldn't have said anything. And that is how we perpetuate things like rape culture and abuse is that we keep it silent so that people can feel comfortable with um, their abuses. And we have to speak um, so that the person that we're speaking of or people that we're speaking of have an opportunity to um, do better because that's the only way we do better is by telling the truth. Perfect, so I'm gonna wrap up by reading some of the comments coming in. Uh, first, somebody is suggesting that you write an autobiography um, just because I think your story has been that compelling. So we're just putting it out there. Um, we have a comment that says, this has been the most useful, hold on, and in, I'm like lost by, and it's the most inspiring and useful conversation for me and everyone else here. And someone else said, it takes so much courage to still pursue with so many challenges, obstacles, doubts, and fears. So I think that sums it up well. I think what this conversation did for all of us here, um, we're all super proud of you. Um, you know, those that know you for years and those that just met you, I think we're all rooting for you. We're looking for that movie, you let us know. And, we'll, and I think the other thing is your birthday is next week. So, you know, all of us wanna wish you a happy birthday. Um, you know, thank you so much. And, and when I knew Robert, when I first met him, first of all, I didn't know he was, he was 30 uh, when I was working with him as a college student. And I didn't know all of this about Robert. You know, he, he was humble and, you know, I, I just really developed to discover this after, you know, in terms of all the obstacles he, he faced along the way. Um, and so thank you for inspiring me and everybody else that was with us today. Thank you right. so much for having me, Natalia, Lisa. Um, and I wanna also say thank you to everybody who attended, but also to Marge Magner um, who I had the absolute um, um, privilege to meet on one, on one or two occasions. And I was able to tell her um, the effects the Magnus Center had on me in terms of not just my career, but my impact on me as a person. And so thank you to her for, for this, um, the idea of a, of a Magnus Center, which I think is so invaluable. And thank you, of course, Natalia, for all the hard work that you have been doing for years and years and years for the Magnus Center. Thank you very much. It's it's my pleasure. It's it's my purpose. You know what I do every day is I love it. So I, I I didn't know that when I graduated college or graduate school that this is where I'd be, but I'm I'm where I should be, and it's because of students like you that that uh, that that I know Mike, Sabine, Andre, everybody that works, Jocelyn, everyone that's here. That's why we love what we do. It's the students that we get to see develop and uh, you know reach their 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 goals. It's, it's a great thing for us. So um, thank you. Everyone's wishing you happy birthday, um, oh, beautiful you. messages. And I will, I'm saving the chat so I could share it with you because you have to read these comments. It's amazing. All right. Well, thank, thank you everybody. We did record. So as long as you registered, we'll, we'll share it with you um, after um, the session. So thanks again. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, everyone.